about eight minutes till the hour now. Just like Dr. Alameen, I was wondering if any of you have questions or concerns before we go live, get started. All right, we are live right now, actually, there. Well, I'm just waiting to see these videos coming through the uh, YouTube channel. It should be showing up, uh, showing up here, yeah. Dr. Elamin, I'm going to wait for her and um, I won't start until she gets here or until five o'clock, whichever. Sure.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Wesley McNeese. I serve as the SIU System Executive Director for Diversity Initiatives. And I want to welcome you to this evening's conversation dealing with race-based trauma and its relationship to mental health. This will be a two hour event virtual and it's our third in a series of conversations of understanding that are aimed at the SIU community and its extended audience. This activity is sponsored by the SIU system president's office and the system's diversity advisory council. And before we delve into the topic, the SIU system president, Dr. Dan Mahoney, has an update to give. Thank you, Dr. McNeese. And I have just a few items I'll talk about today. Uh, we have discussed uh, before, obviously, that there are multiple task forces and committees working on each of the campuses and as well as at the system level, uh, focusing on our anti-racism efforts. And they will be reporting to me on September 30th uh, with kind of updates on where they are. So for next month's conversation, on October 14th, I'll have probably a much more extensive update on, on what they've come up with over the last couple of months. But a few things I do want to highlight, um, and many of this I talked about at the board meeting last week, but I will be seeking at the next board meeting formal approval for the system vice president. This is a new role, system vice president for anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and chief diversity officer. Um, but I will say I do have informal support from the board and they are completely behind this. So I've already begun the preparation process. I actually reached out to a search firm today to start working on that. Uh, we'll start to put together a committee. So after the board gives me formal approval, we'll move forward with the search as quickly as possible. Uh, we also talked a lot last week about some of the changes in our scholarship and admissions, pro admissions processes. Um, really that's all focused on increasing access and equity. So the SIU system commitment, which again will provide uh, students an opportunity to come without having to pay for tuition or mandatory fees if they come from lower income families. That will be available both at SIUE and SIUC. Uh, both campuses are now test optional, as well as pro both provide opportunities for merit scholarships without submitting test scores. Again, this was something I talked about during our first conversation as one of the, I think, examples of systemic racism is the overreliance on test scores, which are biased in a number of different ways taking them out of both our admissions process and our scholarship process will increase again, access and equity. Uh, last week I signed, and today I got the final signed copy back of our agreement to be part of the Southern Regional Education Board's doctoral scholars program. Again, this will provide opportunities for some SIU doctoral students to be involved in their program, which provides additional mentoring opportunities, as well as opportunities to collaborate with colleagues from across the country. It also provide us an opportunity to recruit at their conference. Again, it's the largest gathering of minority PhD students in the country, about a thousand come to their conference every year. So this will be an opportunity to both provide experiences for our students, as well as increase our, our recruitment of diverse faculty. Um, at the board meeting, we also presented the underrepresented group report, which is something required by the state, but I do wanna highlight just a couple things. Uh, SIUE had the highest percentage of underrepresented group students in their freshman class this year. So that was the highest they've ever had. Um, and the Latinx retention rate actually exceeded the overall retention rate for the university. So those were two of the highlights at SIUE. SIUC had 260 African-American freshmen. That was three times what they had in the fall of 2019. There was also a 50% increase in Latinx students as well as a 53.3% in those who identify as two or more races. Um, in addition, SIUC saw a retention rate increase from the fall of 2015, up about 15% for underrepresented students. Still, this is behind the overall retention rate. So as we look forward, we now have increased some of our students coming in, but we need to retain those students and we need to do them at comparable rates as the institution's overall retention rate. So we'll have efforts related to that. And we also want to increase our retention, our recruitment of underrepresented groups going forward. And one of the things that um, SIUC will be doing next year is starting the Seymour Bryson Scholars Program. This will be a summer program to provide students an opportunity to come in early um, and have experiences that will better prepare them for their freshman year. So all of those things are, are things we're looking at. But again, after we get the reports on September 30th, I'm sure I'll have more to report both related to our recruitment and retention efforts. So those are my updates for today. I'll turn it back to you, Dr. McNeese. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. 
Uh, for this evening, we put together a panel of SIU institutional and student leaders. Uh, they're going to give their impressions of this topic, race-based trauma and mental health. And then you, the audience, will be given an opportunity to ask questions or make comments, and the panel will respond. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Courtney Bodie, Director of Counseling Services and Associate Dean of Students for Diversity and Inclusion, SIU Edwardsville. Dr. Anthony Cheeseborough, Associate Professor, History Department, SIU Edwardsville. Dr. Jamie Clark, Director of Counseling and Psychological Services and Associate Director, Student Health, SIU Carbondale. Dr. Wendy Elamine, Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, SIU School of Medicine. Kyra Hunter, a senior in exercise science, a member of the Saluki Unity and Saluki Empowerment Organization, SIU Carbondale. Dr. Timothy Lewis, Assistant Professor of Political Science, SIU Edwardsville. Dr. Brian Lockett, a recent alum of SIU Carbondale, who's now coordinator African-American Black Student Programs at Dixie State University in Utah. Dr. Kimia Saraf, adjunct assistant professor, Department of Medical Humanities and Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, SIU School of Medicine. She is a trauma mitigation specialist. And also we have Christian Watts, a third year student, School of Pharmacy, SIU Edwardsville. Dr. Cheeseboro is going to monitor comments and questions from the audience. And Carol Walker is our Zoom coordinator. Dr. Bodie is gonna start things off by leading us through a preparatory grounding exercise. And then Dr. Elamine will begin to moderate through to the end of the program. Dr. Dan Mahoney will make closing remarks. Dr. Bodie, would you please proceed? Thank you, Dr. McNeese. So I wanted to start off by providing a definition of race-based trauma, so bear with me. Stress is our body's set of responses to the demands under which they're placed. When these responses enhance productivity without causing detriment, we call that eustress, and that's a good thing. When they persistently lead to fatigue, exhaustion, poor health, and even breakdown, we refer to that as distress, and we don't want that. Post-traumatic stress is an extreme type of distress. In addition to the fight, flight, freeze responses we see in particularly life-threatening experiences, we further see this quartet of symptoms among patients exposed to traumatic stressors. One is intrusion, where people have unwanted memories and maybe dream content that's filled with events related to the traumatic. Two, persistent avoidance of the traumatic stressor, because who would want to think about that? Three, a shift toward negativity and patterns of thinking and feeling. And four, a shift in the way that we respond um, when it comes to how our arousal, arousal and reactivity system functions like heightened startle response. Traumatic stressors can either be big T or little t, and they're often grouped into the following three categories. Singular events like a car accident, recurring events like being a first responder to these types of events day in and day out, and then the prolonged exposure that might come from adverse childhood experiences, war, or even intimate partner violence. Currently, sociocultural factors such as race-based depression are excluded from the larger discourse on post-traumatic stress and treatment, save for targeted program scholars and providers, most of whom identify as Black. One such example is Dr. Robert T. Carter, a professor emeritus of psychology and education at Columbia University, who's written the most on the subject of race-based traumatic stress. According to Carter, this refers to the mental and emotional injury rather, caused by encounters with racial bias and ethnic discrimination, racism, and hate crimes. Any individual who has experienced an emotionally painful, sudden, and uncontrollable racist encounter is at risk for suffering from a race-based traumatic stress injury. In the US, as you might imagine, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are the most vulnerable due to the underpinning in our society of white supremacy. 
This is an example of why we call discrimination, even if in its most subtle forms, a social determinant of health. For example, though a socially constructed phenomenon, race is presently the leading predictor of one's life expectancy, subjective sense of well being, career trajectory, access to quality health care, um, and likelihood of developing patterned substance misuse. Activating events for race based traumatic stress include exposure to racial stereotypes, fear about personal safety, witnessing members of a person's group experience abuse on the basis of race, racist abuse of loved ones, direct exposure to these types of experiences, and even things as um, seemingly benign as others not taking ser um, experiences of racism very seriously. When people are exposed to this sort of um, event or type of event, for a long period of time, we can see extreme difficulty being able to find a state of calm. Dissociation, the internalization of racism, hypervigilance, adaptive paranoia, and then of course, chronic and persistent anxiety, depression, and substance misuse. We know that talking about these types of experiences can come with a whole range of reactions, some that we expect and others that we don't. What's important to remember is this, it's in the present moment, the here and now, if you will, that we have the greatest access to our resources. To prepare for this type of conversation, I invite you to engage in the following activity with me, It'll be very brief. So sit up straight and take in a few calming breaths. And you know you're breathing well because that stomach is, po stomach is poking out a little bit. Begin to turn your head and slowly look around in all directions especially behind you. Orient yourself in the surrounding space. Note what sounds you hear, the smells that fill the air, any warmth or coolness, and any colors that stand out. Noticing a little yellow over there. When you're done scanning your environment, face forward again and return your attention to your body. Sense how your feet rest against the ground and how your behind rests against the seat of the chair. Now notice any other sensations in your body, the bend in your knees, your spine, be it straight or crooked, the breeze in your hair or scalp, your middle and any tension you hold there, and your chest expanding and shrinking with each breath that you take. Notice what your body experiences inside your clothing. Pay attention to where your skin touches your undergarments and even the clothes outside. Starting at the top of your head, bring your attention slowly down through your body. Notice each sensation as your attention passes it. You may notice warmth or coolness, relaxation or tightness, softness or pressure, energy or numbness. So throughout the conversation and just moving forward in general, you may find the shortcut five, four, three, two, one to be quite useful when you notice things happening for you that are maybe not quite what you want. So it would be, what are five things that I see? Four things that I can touch. Three things that I hear. Two things that I smell, hopefully pleasant and one thing that I can taste or maybe would like to taste like that delicious mint. Um, it can help you to reclaim the moment, a useful strategy in regulating back so that you feel better, but also that you have greater access to your skills. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi, for providing us with a framework for the work that we're gonna be doing today and also giving us some new skills. I think that, um, that's something that I definitely appreciated, especially when you said something you'd like to taste. I thought about a pecan pie and I hadn't thought about that in a minute. So thank you for that. Um, I'm Dr. Wendy Wills Elamine. I'm the Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at SIU School of Medicine. And I'd like to welcome you to our third conversation of understanding. I want to thank our System Diversity Advisory Committee Dr. McNeese and also Dr. Mahoney for their vision for these critical conversations. I also want to acknowledge our panelists today for their time, for 
their courage, and for their willingness to share their experiences and insight with us. I believe that we can only make impactful changes if we're proximate to the lived experiences of those who have been impacted by racism. The only way that we're going to make progress on this journey to racial healing and justice is if we have space and time to truly honor those stories and to come up with solutions. So before we get started, I, being a physician, whenever I hear things, it's my tendency to initially want to fix it. If I have something, I see a diagnosis, I want to treat them. However, in this format today on Zoom, we're going to listen to stories, we're going to hold space and we're gonna honor those stories. And then after we hear all of the stories, we're going to go ahead and move to our audience and to engage in a deeper dialogue. I think that listening is a powerful tool. It's a tool that we don't use enough. I also want us to remember that we have to practice sitting with discomfort and Dr. Bodhi gave, gave us some tools because sometimes the stories we hear are uncomfortable. And um, if we can learn to sit with that discomfort, we could come out on the other side healed and also giving other people the opportunity to become closer to understand what people are experiencing. And also we have to accept that there may be a place where we don't have closure because this is a journey. This is not going to be a quick fix for us getting to the other side. So the prompt that we have provided everyone with, and I'm going to repeat this so that everyone is reminded, we want you to share a story dealing with race-based trauma and tell how that story impacted you. We also want you to talk about one important thing that SIU community should know about this topic. And to begin, I'm going to call on Dr. Timothy Lewis, if he could begin us on this journey this afternoon. First, let me say good evening to everyone. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to sit on this panel. I consider myself a dwarf among giants, and I am just privileged to be here. The, the question that you posed as to detailing or describing an incident of race-based trauma is a flawed question. And I mean no insult by that statement. Your question or your prompt prompts us to think of an incident in which we've experienced racial trauma in a largely harmonious and normal existence. And that doesn't match reality for many racial minorities or for many African-Americans. You see, Black people don't have incidents of racial trauma. We exist in racial trauma. We experience racism and the subsequent trauma as early as we can walk, talk. Then we are placed in educational systems that think the contributions of Blacks are limited to Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and Harriet Tubman, all while glorifying the savagery of Christopher Columbus. That same system would place us in handcuffs at age eight, but assign a white youth an individualized educational program. And so we are fighting this system, internalizing our own trauma to achieve some semblance of success. And then perhaps after 11 years of post-secondary education, four degrees, 30 certifications, all at the price of a quarter million dollars, we are set aside from a colleague who tells us the only reason we are employed at the university is because we are Black. We are employed uh, at places that would rather use the First Amendment to defend racists and regulate the freedom of speech of anti-racists. And then when we leave those places, we can't even buy dinner in our own neighborhoods because our grocery stores are food deserts. And shopping on the more affluent part of town turns a, a grocery run into a debate about Blackness and what that means with someone who's only seen Black people on TV. We do all of this each and every day, day in and day out. And then we lay our head down at night, hoping that our, as our heavy heads hit a cold pillow, that physical relief will also translate into some relief from this mental and emotional trauma. And we pray to our creator for providence and protection, not protection from the vagabond, the gangster, the thug, or the criminal, but protection from the racist policing system that will shoot us eight times in our sleep. So again, you ask of an incident of racial trauma. I guess I can respond to your question with a question. How does one whose very existence evoke racism 
only identify one incident of racial trauma. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. That was profound. I almost feel like we need to have a little bit of silence in between if we're not going to comment, but um, I'm going to move to Christian Watts. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my experience with you all. Um, I was completing a pharmacy rotation. Um, the pharmacist I was shadowing for the day was administering flu shots. I asked if I could sit in on the next flu shot, allowing me to see how the shot was actually given and how the pharmacist kept the patient at ease. The pharmacist said, yes, it was okay for me to attend the next flu shot session. As we went into the room, the pharmacist provided an introduction as such. Good afternoon, patient. My name is, I am the pharmacist. The pharmacist then turned to me and introduced me as such. This is Christian. He is going to be shadowing us today. Rest assured, he's a good boy. He's a smart boy, and I think we may actually keep him. Some of you may not understand what is wrong with that statement, so let me explain. The term boy stems all the way back to slavery times. African-American males, whether child or adult, were referred to as boy by their slave master. For example, get out in the yard and pick that cotton boy. Fast forwarding to today's time, the term boy or good boy, smart boy, or used to refer to a pet. This introduction made by the pharmacist made me feel uncomfortable. And quite honestly, I did not feel comfortable speaking up because my experience was graded. What I would like the SIUE community to take from this is, pay attention to those learned behaviors that have practically become innate. The ones that are almost like a reflex. They just come out without you thinking about it. These behaviors can be just as bad as blatant racism because you can't fix a problem that you are unaware of. Therefore, when your peers and friends of color inform you that something you did was offensive, instead of arguing what your intent was, recognize that your actions had an impact and change your behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for sharing that story. I'm going to now go to Dr. Jamie Clark. Thank you. Um, as a psychologist who specializes in working with trauma survivors, I've had dozens of students whose stories have touched me. I've had a lot of personal experiences hearing stories who have touched me, um, just like the ones that you've already heard here tonight. Um, so I couldn't just choose one story. So tonight, what I want to share with you is an event that touched me and changed me. On September 2nd, uh, the Chancellor's Task Force for Diversity had a listening session where dozens of the SIUC students took risks to come in and talk to us about their experiences on campus. Uh, this event was scheduled for two hours, but because of how many students came on and wanted to share their stories with us and share their experiences here at SIUC, it lasted nearly three. This was very, very powerful for me and changed me. Our students are hurting. There were tears, there were emotionally charged words, there was gratitude, and there was solidarity in the fact that we're not there, we're not where we need to be. There's a lot of people hurting on this campus. I love SIU. I've been a Saluki for 15 years. I embrace diversity and have been an advocate for diversity. And in that moment, I knew how much better I need to do. Racism exists all over our campus and more so uh, than I knew in some ways that it was still there. In that night from our SIUC students, we heard stories about race-based traumatic injuries, um, anywhere from overt racism hate crimes, cruel intentional acts, uh, to the systemic racism and institutional barriers that people have, even in healthcare in the areas that I'm working. 
um, vicarious trauma, how the media and some of the news events, some of the police shootings are impacting their day-to-day -day existence. Um, some of the symbols that we're using, the intergenerational symbols, different flags, monuments, you wonder how those impact from uh, how they carry down from generations. We heard about that. We heard about discrimination that's going on in our classrooms at SIU, on the athletic field, in our workplaces, uh, racial profiling on campus, um, and a lot of microaggressions. But I think the worst and the most painful thing, the thing that touched me the most, is that our students are most impacted by the silence. When these transgressions are happening on our campuses, uh, the, the silence that comes with that. Um, and, and meanwhile, they're going through all of this while dealing with a national pandemic. I want you to know that this was my event uh, that was the most impactful to me because I heard your pain and I felt your suffering through that. Um, and as we progress through this conversation, I want those of you who experienced this racial trauma to know uh, that I see you, I hear you, I value you, and I support you. And I just want to say thank you to those of you who have tuned in tonight, those students that took those risks to talk to us, uh, because you've really uh, moved me and guided uh, kind of my responses throughout this night of the most important thing that I think the SIU community needs to know. And I think that I'm adding to this part as a psychologist, and that is that these race-based traumas can have impacts on the wiring of our brains. Um, though they can create different pathways. They can create things and symptoms that are like PTSD. And like Dr. Bodhi pointed out, this can rewire things to where they're exhibiting symptoms and experiencing symptoms um, that aren't even acknowledged in the mental health field. And so I think it's really important that as we look at these paths um, that we understand the impact that they can have. And I'm hoping that as this conversation goes on tonight that I can talk more uh, kind of about these pathways and how some of that impact goes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Clark. I'm now going to call on Dr. Kimia Saraf. Good evening, everyone. I, uh, I want to start just by acknowledging the incredible work uh, that's already been done tonight. Um, it is um, it's an honor to sit and be allowed to bear witness to the stories that are being told and the the vulnerability that is being shared and um, to be taught. And I think that that's an important thing to remember is that, um, that when we do these types of things, we are asking uh, folks who have experienced the trauma to teach us about what that has been like. And that is um, uh, an awesome responsibility to put on someone else to, to enter back into their pain and into their trauma in order to, to share and to help others to understand. So thank you for your willingness to be part of this this evening. I was most interested um, as I was listening, actually, um, Dr. Lewis, I, I counted as you spoke about the traumas that you've experienced. And I counted prenatal and educational and institutional and financial and community and national and intergenerational and familial and professional and epigenetic and then I lost track. And um, that's a lot, that is a lot. And um, I can say that uh, as a physician, as a public health professional, um, I have worked with uh, individuals impacted um, by trauma for many, many, many years. And in the last six months, um, I've seen new things um, starting to bubble up and, and what it looks like is acute trauma on top of all of those traumas that have been there just under the surface for hundreds of years. So we're looking at acute on chronic and then another acute on chronic and then another acute because it seems like almost every day brings us uh, a fresh experience. And so, um, uh, like Dr. Clark, I see and I hear and um, I am bearing witness um, to much of this in colleagues and in uh, students who are calling and needing a place to offload some of this. 
And so that brings me to um, what I would like to leave as a thought, which is that um, all of us, every single person uh, has the ability to learn to be a trauma mitigator. We can learn to do that for self. And Dr. Bodhi, you gave us some great grounding exercises that when we recognize we're having a trauma reaction, we're feeling that bubble up can help. And there are wonderful tools at our disposal to learn to trauma mitigate for each other. And to learn to do that, to learn to move through this world in a way that holds space for the pain of others without trying to fix it, without trying to correct it, without trying to redirect it. Um, just holding that liminal space as we move through this period of transition uh, is such an important skill to learn and it is something that all of us can learn. Um, and it's a gift that we can give to one another through that connection. So that is what I would, I would leave for the SIU community is that um, not only should we not be alone, but we can all learn how to make those connections with each other to hold and support each other as we move through this time. Because there can be post-traumatic growth. And that's what I'm holding space for is the what comes after this. Because I think that we're going to continue to move towards that salutogenesis. We're talking about trauma today, but there's what's after the trauma. And that is what we can help each other to move towards is that, is that healing centered engagement and that salutogenesis that is focused on us and our healing. So thank you all so much for, for being here and, and for the incredible heavy lift that we've had. Thank you, Dr. Saraf, for your insights. And I think that we'll definitely be coming back to some of these topics of uh, salutogenesis and post-traumatic growth as we get into a deeper discussion. I'm now gonna call on uh, Kyra Hunter. Hi, um, I'm Kyra. I am a um, senior here at SIUC. Um, I'm also on the volleyball team here and I am um, a part of Salute Unity, which is the Athletic Diversity, Inclusion and Equality Committee. And I'm also the head of Women's Empowerment, which is a women's um, safe space for female student athletes. And um, my race-based trauma um, happened when I was in high school. Um, I'm from Alabama, so you can, um, you already have your preconceived notions of the deep south. And when I was playing club volleyball, um, one of my teammates' dads at one of our very first tournaments, he was like, you're a pretty good volleyball player. And I was like, thank you. And he was like, I've never seen a black girl play like that. And in my head, I was just like, I can't believe he just said that. But I was just, I was naive and I was 14 and I was like, okay and I just walked away but that embedded in my head that I had to be 10 times better than everyone else just to be half the player that my white counterparts were and my other teammates were so that just and like that embedded like that just made me like want to always prove someone wrong just because like I'm black doesn't mean that I can't be a good volleyball player and that just because I'm black doesn't mean I can't have a scholarship to a good college and so um what I want to say to like the SIU community is that um just because that um just because racism is happening and racism is you don't see it happening all the time everywhere it's still happening it happens in the classroom it happens in our athletic department it happens on every team and um, what I want to leave here by saying is um, create a space of allyship. And just because you don't identify with the group that is being oppressed and the group that's being judged doesn't mean that you can't help. And I think creating a safe space where allyship is the number one of the number one things that we teach and we um, go about like go about the right way. I feel like everyone can feel included. And I think that um, creating that safe space is what I want to do with Saluki, with, with Saluki and Power. And I feel like um, starting here, it can branch off to anywhere we want it to branch out as long as we 
keep keep up with it and as long as we do our jobs so all right thank you so much kyra um, I love the idea of us getting into the concept of allyship so that everybody has a role and can really feel that they have um, the ability to help us make the pivots that we need. I'm now gonna call on Dr. Bodhi. I just really wanted to talk about experiences um, seeking medical care. Um, it's only occurring to me in the last week, two weeks, just how much my passion for mental health care and quality access and listening and believing people when they tell you their stories. It never occurred to me that that has come from having had a number of providers that I've worked with um, by whom I did not feel heard. Um, so I would say that the primary examples would be in um, primary care. Um, going to generalists and describing gastrointestinal pain and even asking for specific treatments or specific examinations and being told um, quite outright, you, you don't need that. Um, that's not in my opinion. And therefore, because it's not in my opinion that I'm not going to do it, you know, those sorts of things. And all I'm talking about is an endoscope. Um, the second one would be dentists. Um, and again, in making any of these statements, it isn't saying that dentists are, or physicians are, nurse practitioners are, just the ones that I've experienced, but the data, but the data. Um, and so what I'm thinking about is a particular experience of having a root canal done right here. As invasive as it sounds, it shouldn't be much of anything, not, not in 2020, right? But you go and someone's all, all down up in there, not a dentist, don't quite know what to call things, and I'm telling you, I can feel your drill. And I told you that 10 minutes ago, and I told you that 20 minutes ago, and I told you that 30 minutes ago. So give me some more Novocaine, like I asked you, because I can feel your drill in my mouth. And when I reflected on it, that had been the experience with prior dentists also. And it just is occurring to me. This is what I mean by the internalization of racism the ways in which we can perceive life events around us as quite normative when everyone around you can share the same event. That doesn't make it okay though. Um, and the one thing that I would like to leave the community with is let us please abandon, divorce, divest from this idea of ever asking again, ever, 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 if racism is a valid experience and if it harms people, we know those things. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. I think that you brought in the, uh, the, a concept of listening from a different way, being a physician, we really do need people to, to listen to black pain. And uh, when you look at some of the data around that, that's definitely one of the areas that we need to continue to improve on. And our last panelist is uh, Dr. Brian Lockett. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm going to answer this question in two parts. Uh, the second part, I don't think I can get off of this um, panel discussion without mentioning um, um, a mentor of mine and um, and just a mentor of mine, right? I don't need to add more. But the first part is a story, uh, just like a little uh, preface to what I'm what I will read. And so I grew up, I am from Arlington Heights, Illinois, northwest suburbs of Chicago, about five and a, five and a half hours north of Carbondale. Um, and I went to Rolling Meadows High School. And I remember growing up, um, I lived in a predominantly white community. And growing up, I um, would go out, do just simple things that I never put two and two together. Um, go to school, go to class when the topic of slavery or Black History Month comes up. Uh, when they say Black History Month in school, it's usually Black History Month Day. And how many times can we read um, I Have a Dream speech, right? And then uh, you have the other students in the room who stare at me looking and the teacher uh, waiting for a response to the question of how does slavery make you feel? And me growing up around people that did not look like me, I never had that answer. Um, it's like, I mean, when I think about it now, I'm like, well, let me turn that question on you, right? Um, and growing up in that community, I remember um, 
going outside in the yard and mowing the lawn. And every time I would mow the lawn, I love mowing the lawn, it was therapeutic for me. Um, until I started noticing that every time I was mowing the front lawn um, and cars would drive past that and the people in those cars did not look like me, uh, would stare at me. And, and so I'm like, mm, why are you staring? Uh, wave, right? Uh, so the older I got, I started putting two and two together. Um, because I didn't look like everybody, I didn't look like my neighbors. The family didn't look like my, their, um, our neighbors. Um, and so like the older I got, um, and by older, I think this was probably my, I was 18, senior year in high school. And uh, I started waving. And I really put, and that was almost like an experiment, right? Like a, 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 bl a single blind study. It's like, I knew what was going on, but I was testing the reaction of individuals. So those who would stare me down and I would wave to you, those who would wave back, I'm like, oh, we've got, we, we're working with something. But those who wouldn't, I had to always ask the question, why would they not wave back if they're spending so much time staring at me? So there's, there's a story. And so the next half of uh, how I'm going to respond to this is a, a quote <clears throat> from the collected essays of James Baldwin. Okay. Uh, can't talk about, it almost feels like you can't talk about race-based trauma without speaking anything on James Baldwin. And so the quote is from the fire next time. And so I'll read it. <clears throat> Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it is so profoundly, I'm sorry, it is so profoundly attacks one sense of one's own reality. Well, the black man has functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar. And as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundations. You don't be afraid, I said. That, it was, that is what that it was intended that you should perish in the ghetto, perish by never being allowed to go behind the white man's definitions, by never being allowed to spell your proper name. You have, and many of us have, defeated this intention and by a terrible law, a terrible paradox. Those innocents who believe that your imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp of reality. But these men are your brothers, your lost, younger brothers. And if the world, excuse me, integration, if the, I'm sorry, if the word integration means anything, this is what it means that we with love shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will again. And we can make America what America must become. And that is again from the fire next time from the collected essays of James Baldwin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lockett, and thank you for bringing in uh, James Baldwin. I think that you're right that it's hard to have a conversation around this topic and not bring his wisdom into, into the room. So I wanted to thank all of our panelists for sharing their, their strength and vulnerability at the same time. And uh, we're going to dive in deep to some questions. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna be doing is we're getting questions from our YouTube. Please add those questions in as we're moving forward because we do truly want this to be a conversation. And the first question that we have received is, how do we get people to understand what we know? How do we make people understand what we know? So Dr. Bodhi, are you able to take that one or Dr. Lockett, you wanna take that one first? Be my guest. Thank you. Um, I think it's simple. It's uh, um, make people uncomfortable with the uncomfortable, right? Uh, we hear the, um, when we talk about uh, these topics, especially breast based trauma, um, people often don't want to speak on it, right? It's that stigma around it. It's, all, it's the stigma around mental health. It's that stigma around um, <laughs> racism. Like, can we be comfortable enough to talk it, uh, talk about it? Or if we talk, if we don't talk about it, um, it may not exist, right? And so, but we have to force that conversation in 
because we have to force people to be uncomfortable with what's going on so they can we can have the closest opportunity or the best opportunity to get something done. And so be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Thank you. Dr. Saroff, you can Dr. Bodie, were you going to add some in and then Dr. Saroff? Yeah. I just wanted to say, you know, there's something really powerful about an agent to agent interaction. And so my first thought is, while we have allies who hopefully are becoming accomplices um, or are already acting as such, for me, that's where the work is. How do cisgender white men talk to other folk with that same sort of position and power in society about the stuff? Uh, And how do we learn to really Rock. listen? How do we learn to really, truly sit in the discomfort? Uh, Dr. Lockett was talking about the discomfort of speaking and how do we learn to sit in the discomfort of listening without fixing, of listening without having the answer, of listening without the solution to it um, and, and believing what we're hearing also you know, recognizing that um, others' experiences are true and, and just being uncomfortable and sit in the, un, in the non-closure of all of that, I think is very, very important. And then the next thing is how do we learn to lean in so that we're close enough that we're getting hit by the stones too, right? That, that's that true allyship, accompliceship that you were talking about, that you named it. How do we get close enough that that um, we too are are in there? And I think that happens when we ask questions, uh, and we again are learn to be uncomfortable um, in that space together until we're comfortable. I think another thing that I want to add to the conversation is that we also have to be really careful about what we're looking at as data points and metric points. A lot of the data has been um, quantitative as opposed to the qualitative analysis. We have to make sure that we're capturing the data as, in a qualitative way so that we are actually hearing the stories and honoring the stories. So I think that we need to get more um, uh, ways to look at qualitative research. I, I'd also concern me, Dr. Bodhi said, well, you know, Dr. I believe Dr. Carter out of uh, Columbia University who did the race-based stress scale. He is one of the few people that have really, really started to dive down with looking at, well, do we even have a way to measure what's going on? When you look at the DSM-4 diagnosis book, there's only one time discrimination comes up and race is not even one of the elements that we look at as an external stressor. And that's probably my greatest stressor most of the times, you know? So that's one of the reasons why we need to make sure that we are getting more people into academia who are thinking about these types of issues so that we can be innovative and develop some of these skills and innovative with the type of things that we're, we're researching. I know at um, SIU School of Medicine, we had to, we did a, a small research and one of the research um, projects that we did was to talk to our students and our residents of what does it feel like when you walk in the room and the patient does not wanna be seen by you that information had not necessarily been looked at until we started to gather that qualitative analysis. Now we're needing to develop more programs to help our students and our residents navigate when the bias is coming from their patient. So I appreciate our, our future Dr. Watts bringing that into the room that sometimes the bias that we experience doesn't come from the places where we expect it. Sometimes it's coming from our educators and our patients and then it's almost like a drive-by, you get sideswiped, you, you weren't even expecting it. So um, Dr. Clark, were you going to add to this piece before we go into our other questions? I was just gonna say that I, I also think that right now there's sometimes a culture of silence, you know, of not stepping up and not talking. And I think that part of the way that we kind of spread out and get more comfortable with the uncomfortable is through creating a culture of talking about it. I mean, conversations like this and not just having it be, you know, once a year, twice a year, but having it be something that's expected in the culture of SIU, in the SIU system to, you know, be faced with these conversations, to have it really entrenched 
into everything that we do, you know, students, faculty, staff, community. So I think, you know, approaching versus avoiding. When you look at trauma, you know, one of the things that makes trauma the most entrenched is avoidant behavior and avoidance of triggers and avoidance of stressors that might lead to discomfort. And so when you're trying to break down race-based trauma, uh, you want to stop with avoidance. You want to approach versus avoid. And so we need to create that culture, foster that culture in, in all of the areas of the SIU community. If I may, I wanted to expand on a note you made, Dr. Elamine, about the DSM and the ways in which these sort of things are written and structured. So there's never any secrets about like who's writing this stuff and coming up with it. So when we say that representation matters, there are such profound ways in which that's the case. This is a publication of the American Psychiatric Association that's used by some of everybody in mental health. I wanna see more people from other mental health disciplines represented here, but I also wanna see more people who represent a broader diversity of the US population writing because it is one of my deepest senses of disappointment with our field that I can't work with somebody and pull something out of this that perfectly reflects their experiences, whether the concern, the stressor, if you will, was race or gender identity. Um, there really isn't much of an opportunity to do so without further pathologizing people. It's a great point. Yeah, you know, I also add on to that a little bit. Um, I've been working, I've been working on an I ideas, and ideas is an acronym. Um, and it actually came up with it this weekend, just thinking up in pre preparation for this conversation. And so ideas spelled I D E A S, right? Um, the I inclusion, the D diversity, E equity, A accountability, and the S. Um, I was, it was going to be another, another A, but I, I was, idea spelled wrong. But what the S is the sorry, right? And it's that why it, we're not, a, why we're not comfortable with the uncomfortable is because it's only, it's not really, it has never been, um, addressed. We've never, no, there's never been an apology. And so that's why we're not, in my opinion, that's why we're not comfortable with things. So once you come, we can do everything, we can, we can have these conversations, right? Uh, we can do certain actions um, um, and we can see these little steps, but they go nowhere if there's never an acknowledgement, like a sincere apology for the, um, for the situation we're in. And we see, and that's how we create that space to where if we, I mean, I, Tuskegee comes to mind, right? We, 40 years. Right, um, and then we we had Clinton, um, you know, acknowledge it, right? Um, and then you then we hear about it. But like we to get anywhere, they has to, to have these uncomfortable conversations. There needs to be an outcome of an apology. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to um, the next question. We have a, a lot of questions coming in. So, what programs are there to teach diversity in smaller and less diverse communities? Anybody have any thoughts? What, one of my initial thoughts was is that one of the unintended consequences of COVID is that everything has moved to Zoom now. So it's very easy to um, get training if you have access to a computer. Uh, SIU School of Medicine, we just had a cohort of individuals who went through Racism 101 uh, with Patty D. And that was a very informative opportunity that we all did by Zoom. And then we had the opportunity to meet people nationally. Crossroads is another one that has actually gone uh, to Zoom as well. So I think that that's one of the unintended consequences that we're learning about these platforms and how we can pull together. And I have been very surprised how far you can get. I, I used to think you had to be in the room to make transformation happen, but I was able to witness some transformations happening on Zoom. Dr. Lockett, did you want to add to that? I was wondering if you can repeat the question. I was like breathing, heavy breathing over here. <laughs> oh, okay. The question was, um, what programs are there to teach diversity in smaller and less diverse communities? Yeah, I can, but I can also answer it. Um, okay. Shameless plug, I got a degree from one of, the, uh, from one of those programs on SIUC campus, uh, the Africana Studies Department. Um, so not only it, it was a program, but it was also the people there. So the people there taught me, I, the people are, the people in that department and on that, and as well as the, the newer administration 
have been um, are people we can go to and they see and they want action. Um, and so I, I like I don't know what what I would be if I didn't have the resources that I got to meet uh, at SIU for ten years. Um, Dr. Elmi, I remember when I uh, first met you, um, it was almost like um, like it was it was again family. It was a family dynamic, and we had a uh, strong, deep conversation. Um, and I got that from teachers, uh, faculty, and staff on the, and administrators on that campus. So um, shameless plug again, the Africana Studies Department. And um, I guess the SIU system. Okay, here's the next question here. Um, it says, what about the experiences of non-African American minorities? Dr. Bodhi, you're shaking your head. Can you start us off with this one? I so appreciate the question because I think that one of the concerns I've always had about terms like anti-racism is that are we talking about anti against all races or are we really talking about anti-black racism and trying to about face that? And I can imagine for many people who exist in the BIPOC community who aren't black, there's a sense of where am I in the larger conversation? Um, and what I would say is that, and this may be to uh, a portion of what Dr. Lockett had mentioned with that sense of like, there really hasn't been a racial reckoning. There's just been sort of a subversion of race. Um, and so I think that there's a certain amount of race as part of an American caste system that has never been a properly labeled and acknowledged. And I think that because racism against indigenous folks and racism against black folk in particular are formative to our country in terms of how we established its economy, quite literally. Um, I think that part of the problem is that um, there isn't much uh, space for it. Um, but I do think that there's considerable space in terms of joining. Um, and I wonder often about that. What does it look like for us to join each other in each other's causes? Um, what happens if people, all people can get on board um, abolishing anti-Black racism um, would that perhaps create more space and more opportunities for some of the other challenges to disappear? And also for some of the ways in which race in general shows up as a, a limiting factor in life, does that start to go away if we actually address the ways in which it affects black folks and black bodies? So Dr. Bodhi, you, you uh, used something that I just wanna make sure everybody was aware of. Can you define BIPOC just yes. so that our audience is aware? Mm -hmm. It would be a newer acronym that people are using to refer to Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Um, so a way to be able to group concerns while also teasing out the specific ones. The one thing I'll say about it is that I notice people using BIPOC in many situations when what they do actually mean is Black or perhaps another racial group. So my only word of caution is to be specific unless you're trying to capture a whole group that's multifaceted. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to make a comment? I would just add in, you know, in addition to what was said that, you know, a lot of the conversation is also based around where the research and some of the articles come from. But, you know, when you look at personal experiences, I've certainly worked with a lot of students who have experienced race based trauma from all different backgrounds, you know, in all different race. And so I think it's really important to note that when somebody is oppressed and certainly, you know, as many people have mentioned at an early age, ongoing, chronic, it can become chronically traumatic, you know, like a complex trauma. And that is regardless of, you know, how you identify, you know, if you've experienced that oppression. So, you know, I just want, you know, people to understand that, well, you know, there might be more articles and research in certain areas. I certainly from a personal standpoint as a clinician have seen race-based trauma, uh, you know, across multiple races. I think the other thing that we have seen recently with COVID is a lot of the race-based trauma that has been directed toward um, the Asian community as well. And um, right now we're in Hispanic Heritage Month, which is from September 15th to October 15th. And our keynote at the opening last week um, shared a, a powerful story just of being marginalized from speaking in Spanish. And I think that we have to definitely bring all of these stories to the forefront. So I'm going to move to the next. If, if I may, just, just quickly chime sure. in that question. I, I think when we think about racism beyond just anti-Blackness, we have to think about it through the lens of um, 
destroying this notion of white privilege. Um, white privilege builds by its default that whatever is white is normal. And if we can destruct that construct to say that just because something is white, it isn't normal. For instance, when you go to the store, there is no white aisle, but there's an African-American hair aisle, there's, there's an Hispanic aisle for Hispanic food, there's an aisle for Asian food, there is no white aisle. That's because we've normalized whiteness. And so this week I received an email from a student. I just want to read the first two sentences. This student is uh, uh, from Palestine. Her name is Naveen Ayesh. And she said, I just wanted to send you my appreciation for the way you did this week's lecture video. Other than the fact that I'm always thinking in philosophical terms, I don't think I've ever heard any professor in academia utter the word Palestinian. So just by even mentioning the word, thinking about an issue outside the frame of whiteness, this student felt seen for the first time in her entire academic career. And when we can destruct white, de destroy whiteness so that it is no longer the standard for what is normal, then we will become a more racially equitable society. Thank you for adding that. Um, as, as you were talking, another piece that came to my mind that I hear many times is people say, well, people won't pronounce my name the right way, or they won't take the time to learn how to pronounce it. And I always say, well, how is it that we can say pancreatic duodenogenostomy, but we cannot pronounce somebody's name? It's all about the effort and what we feel is important. And if people would understand even more how that signifies somebody's identity, that some mother chose that name, some father chose that name for meeting. Can you tell that I've given birth to a child named Samira who gets called Samurai all the time. So that's one of my pet peeves. Dr. Saraf, you were gonna say something. Well, I just wanted to, to um, underscore what Dr. Lewis just said as my father was Iranian and I grew up uh, in Idaho, in small town Idaho, um, which is very, 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 um, uh, Caucasian and very um, religiously, uh, um, how should I say, very religiously conservative. And so to hear um, someone use Iranian as a non, um, in a non-judgmental and a non-angry way, in, in the 1980s, Iranians weren't, uh, Iran was not one of the more favored places in the United States, let's put it that way. And so it would have been nice had somebody um, asked me where I was from or asked me what my name was uh, without the undertone of, we think you're one of them. And so to, to hear you say how wonderfully well your, your student responded to hearing um, a conversation around Palestinians that I'm going to make an assumption um, didn't vilify uh, something that's happening in the Middle East. Um, I, I just want to underscore that because there are lots and lots of ways that this shows up. After 9-11, I lived in St. Louis after 9-11. I don't think I'd ever had anybody ask me from the time I left uh, Utah and Idaho until after 9-11. I don't think I'd had anyone ask me where my name was from. And then after 9-11 in the coffee shop at the hospital, you know, people started taking note of my name tag again. So it's a really interesting um little thing that happens and yet every time it does it sort of sets you back and I can even remember my dad teaching me in the 80s tell him you're Persian don't ever tell him you're from Iran tell him you're Persian so sort of internalizing some of that ways of protecting ourselves before we go to the next question I want to pull another thread that uh, Dr. Lewis gave us is to me, we talk a lot about microaggressions and the power of microaggressions, but we don't talk enough about those microaffirmations that give people that sense that you belong, that I am here. Like Dr. Clark said, I see you, I hear you. This is where you are supposed to be. So I think, you know, people say, well, what can I do more to help students? Well, give some microaffirmations because the rest of the world is getting it constantly. When we turn on the news, when we turn on everything, you see those positive images. So we have to really focus on the counter narrative to make sure that we are pushing that. So we have a question for Kyra Hunter. And that question is with your role in the sports department, how do you combat 
the racist and discriminatory action in the SIU sports department? Um, I, okay, so being a black woman, I am two of the three things that America does not like. So I think that being um, a black woman and playing a predominantly white sport, I feel like I have to educate people in a way that they understand it and it's not in a demeaning way because some people that I have come in contact with just don't know. Um, I'm one of the first black people that they've encountered that's not quote unquote ghetto, quote unquote like unarticulate, quote unquote uneducated. So um, I have to educate people at a level which in which they understand, but also at a level of which that I am not one to be played with and I'm not one to, I'm not, I'm not one that's not going to tell you how it is. And I'm going to be one, a person that's understanding, but also a person that um, is going to fight for what's right. And I'm trying to be a voice for a community that doesn't have a voice. And I'm a voice for a community of people that look like me, that don't have the opportunities that I have and a, a community that um, has struggled for so long and is still struggling. And I'm trying to fight for um, a right, just a seat at the table, definitely a seat at the table. And I'm trying to fight for um, changes in the world to happen right now. So I don't have to have these like conversations that my mom and dad had to have with me when I was 10 with my children in however many years. So I'm trying to make a change where I am and change change comes from the smallest from the smallest little drop so I think that um, my position in the athletic department, I feel like um, I'm, at, I'm in a position to make change and to make a voice for women and um, student athletes that um, feel up underrepresented. So, yeah. Well, we want you to have more than a seat at the table. We want you to be able to put what needs to be placed on the menu at yeah. the table. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have a couple of other questions here. Um, and I want you all to think about this one. Can a racially traumatized person ever be mentally healthy? So maybe we can focus on what are some of the mitigating things? What are some of the things that we can do to mitigate the trauma that we hear about? You know, Dr. Lewis had a list of different traumas that chronically impact. And especially when we think about a child receiving some of these um, race-based stresses as a child when their mind is actually developing. So Dr. Clark? I can certainly start with that. You know, I, I wanna start with just the question itself, you know, in terms of somebody who's experienced race-based trauma, can they ever be mentally healthy? And I, I wanna challenge that assertion just from the start that, you know, we really do view that as an injury. When you're looking at contextual factors and you're really looking at the etiology of a problem, uh, I think it can be pathologizing just to even assume that somebody who's experienced race-based trauma is not mentally healthy. Um, but I, I think it is important that, you know, and this might be a good opportunity to look at how does this impact uh, the brain and kind of the neuropsychology. So so uh, if you bear with me, I'll, I'll try to do a, a quick analogy um, that, that can relate it. Um, and maybe some of my medical friends can, can chip in here. Um, but imagine that a student decides to cut across the grass to, to walk to class and take a shortcut. So they don't want to take the sidewalk. They want to walk across the, class, uh, the grass. Um, maybe the grass after that, you know, what might you see? It might be laying down. It might be kind of flattened where they ran through the grass, but it recovers, you know, it, it pops back up because it's, you know, a one-time thing. It may be small. Um, now imagine that that same student walks through that path multiple times every day. So they're walking and cutting back and forth uh, to that building through that same path. Um, over time, the grass might start dying in those areas. It might begin to kind of resemble a trail cutting across the grass. You know, when you see kind of pathways that people have made. Um, now, finally, imagine that it's raining and that was newly planted grass and the students running across it in cleats. Now that becomes kind of a, a mud path. And, you know, as the university is looking around and says, wow, you know, other people might start taking that path. And now that is the path um, that's being taken. They might even make a sidewalk there. So uh, that is similar uh, to our brain. So how does that really apply to trauma? 
uh, I want to talk about that in terms of the wiring of our brain. As Dr. Lewis was talking, there are many factors that really impact how race-based trauma impacts our mental health and, and the wiring of our brain. So every time that someone is dealing with something traumatic, the pathways can be altered in the brain to cope with that event. And several factors really influence how traumatic that can be on the development of the neuropsychology. So the earlier in life that that happens, as Dr. Lewis was talking, if this starts at the beginning of your life, from the moment that you're born, that's when you're developing, your brain's developing, um, all of these things are becoming hardwired. So there's a lot of impact if it happens earlier on, similar to the newer grass. So if you run across newer grass, that path is going to be made more firmly. Also, the number of times uh, that the race-based trauma is experienced really impacts it. The number of times that somebody is walking that path, it's similar in the brain. The number of times that you take that path to deal with or cope with the stress and get those traumatic responses. And also, the more intense the act, uh, the more the impact. So, you know, oftentimes, someone might say, well, it's just a microaggression. People are being oversensitive. Well, if you have tons of microaggressions and on a daily basis, or you have a strong overt act that can also impact more strongly the wiring of the brain uh, that really does lead to symptoms of post-traumatic stress, you know, avoidance of wanting to have it happen again, hypervigilance, the anxiety, the depression. And so it's really important when you talk about can they become mentally healthy again, again, I want to reframe that to can we decrease the symptoms that someone's experiencing? And the answer is yes. So sticking with kind of that path example, what you have to do is we as a community have to help too of putting up things to stop this path and stop these symptoms and go a different route. So, you know, with the grass analogy, analogy that might be putting up signs, don't walk here, don't come here, this is, this is dangerous. And so you're diverting them and they have to choose a different path. Um, and over time, if that path isn't used, kind of like the sidewalk, you know, it'll start to crack and grass will pop up and weeds will pop up. And then, you know, the sidewalk will start to crumble. Um, and then we can start to use another path. And that's similar with the neurobiology. By using coping skills, by having a support system, by having a community that really, you know, is supportive and combats uh, and disarms a lot of the microaggressions, having an SIU community that provides resources of equity, not just equality, but equity, and breaks down some of the, the barriers to kind of the equality from a social and economic a healthcare standpoint, you can start to rebuild. You can start to build a different path. Path. You can start to hardwire different coping skills to rely on and decrease the symptoms. Um, but to think that it's still not going to hurt when they're experiencing more race-based trauma, that's always going to be there. There's always going to be things that pop up, but we can actually decrease you know, the symptoms of um, post-traumatic stress by creating a new path and being part of that solution. Thank you. Um, I, I love the metaphor there with the neuroplasticity. I think it's always helpful when you break things down and reminds us that, you know, it is important for us to take a different path, but also people have to be a part of building that path for people. Um, there's another question. What programs have been created to make current students more aware about social injustice on and off campus? Dr. Bodhi, I see you shaking your head as the new Dean of Student Affairs. I know, right? University. Uh, well, some of what we're working on is uh, this program called Diversity EDU. And the idea is that as a part of the first year experience, all students would have some degree of exposure to these types of programs. Um, I may have to get off, there's somebody at my door. Um, and what it is, is a virtual sort of platform in which students, can, well, anybody can access these really fantastic modules that do a little talking, if you will, about all sorts of these basic ideas. So for the person who enters the college experience, not knowing what a microaggression is or not really understanding notions of position in society and those sorts of things, the ways in which um, the larger macro system can influence what happens to the individuals, that's part of it. We also have a number of initiatives that involve dialogue because we know that while getting information is one thing, being able to talk about it uh, with peers or near peers is perhaps most important. Um, we know that those near peer interactions 
um, can be amazingly powerful in terms of helping people to hold on to stuff and actually being able to hear it. It's another one of those ways in which agent to agent kind of shows up. So by no means is that sort of everything, but that's sort of like the bones, if you will, of what types of interventions um, and educational programs we're attempting to put in to ensure that everybody who comes in, students, faculty, and staff, uh, get some exposure. Thank you. I do think we have to have multiple entry points for some people are at this level and they're ready to have that deep dive and other people are at a different level uh, of their comfort. And I think the more we can have multiple entry points at SIU School of Medicine, we have equity ambassadors who have been working on different projects and that has been very helpful for us to create multiple ways for people to become involved. So our next question is, how is the traumatizer affected by race-based trauma? Dr. Lewis, I saw a shift. I'm translating the shift that you want to provide us with some uh, thought process. Um, the traumatizer handicaps themselves when they inflict racial trauma on someone else. The presumption behind race, behind racism and racial trauma is that when you enacted on that person, that that person is the sole victim of, of whatever racism they are, they are experiencing. But actually racism is like a, a ripple, it spreads out. And let's say that you have a professor who has experienced racism at university. Now that professor has certain triggers and trauma points that prevents them from working to their full capacity to offer the best educational service they can for their students. So when the person who initially enacted the racism upon that one person, they actually affected 25 other students in the process by initially enacting racism. And so that is why universities cannot just be race neutral. They must be anti-racism. You see SIUE and the SIU system, if I may say this candidly, in its current form is part of the problem because they presume that egalitarian policies are the answer to racism. Giving everyone the same thing when the society has placed people at different levels only exacerbates the existing racism and discrimination that's already in society. So there's a little unknown type of racism called aversive racism. It's not very well known. Aversive racism is when an institution seeks more so to appease um, those who are in a position of power rather than to accommodate those who are being disadvantaged. And they do this by defaulting to egalitarian policies, all the while trying not to offend the white offenders, but overlooking the minorities who are being the victims. And this is what characterizes the SIU system. Well, Dr. Lewis, do you have evidence of this? Well, of course I do. So um, several of the policies of SIE do this. Uh, University Policy 1J7 explicitly says that student evaluation of teaching is racist, yet you force professors to respond to racist evaluations as if there's a pedagogy that I can create that would stop someone from calling me the N-word. The policies for evaluating professional staff are highly unstructured and in some cases non-existent because they're based off white traditionalism as described by Leanne Bell. SIUE requires training on every subject except racism. And then you create an anti-racism task force and you glaze over the recommendations of the people who are the racial experts. And herein lies the, herein lies the racial trauma because you create a system of distrust. You expect the community, particularly the members of color in the community, to trust the administration when they're not in the room and I can't even trust them when they're saying things to my face. Dr. Lewis, I'm, I think that I read your shift right. I, I knew you had something to say on that one. Um, I'm going to go to another question. Thank you for, for that insight. Um, there's another question that says, how would we infuse the importance of racial equity in K through 12 curricula 
and from there ensure that future generations combat internalized racism and in other social institutions. And I think that we've been talking a lot about systemic racism, personally mediated racism, and now we're bringing in internalized racism. So how can we do that? So do we have anybody who wants to make comments on that? Or who's received, you know, gone through K through 12 and received a great education around uh, topics of racism? Well, I certainly couldn't speak to that latter part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that um, we had a panel on the SIUE campus last Wednesday um, that was um, a collaboration between the anti-racism task force that Dr. Lewis mentioned and the Dream Collective, um, which is part of our School of Education, Health and Human Behavior was something started by our new Dean, um, Robin Hughes. And um, among the things we discussed, the theme of the panel was around um, cultural trainings and multicultural courses and like, do we need to rethink them? Because is there perhaps something inherently biased about having a whole 60 hour program and a class that's intended to focus on these notions that's often placed in the summer um, and not particularly taught always by core faculty, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that was mentioned uh, by Dr. Jennifer Hernandez was some restructuring of the secondary education program. And what, it's, what I was hearing was this sort of shift from there's a course in the curriculum that's focused on diversity and inclusion to woven in intentionally measurable and very visible ways to anyone, student, prospective student, faculty member, someone passively reviewing SET, um, that that would be inherently interwoven in there. And what I anticipate is that the teachers who are trained in that program will be put in the position to be able to go into the classroom or do whatever they do um, with much greater facility uh, with some of these things. Because I think to that point, I, I imagine there's a lot of people who would like to do right, whatever that might be. Um, I think there's far too many people uh, who haven't received the proper training to do so. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Dr. Lewis. Um, what can your everyday student do to help deconstruct what you call, in quotes, white normal? Is it something that can be done on a small scale? So I, I, I will try to answer this question with infusing some, some context from the last question. Um, white normalcy is how the system is created. It's a systems issue. So your last question about K-12, we have to be honest and admit that the K-12 system in the United States was never meant for racial minorities. We need to begin with that premise. We're trying to patch a system that was never meant to operate this way. The fundamental thing that you do, if let's say you're renovating a home and you find out that the damage is beyond a general renovation. As a person who's worked in construction, you would demo the home and then rebuild a new home because trying to perform a, a rehabilitation on that home would be would, would cost too much financially and would put too much labor uh, in the process. We've spent this time of trying to patchwork white systems in the United States, everything from policing to education to healthcare, rather than taking the considerable amount of time with the expertise we have in this country to create new systems that are meant and designed to be the inclusive and equitable structures that we aspire to. You cannot take something that is broken, give it partly new parts, then expect it to operate at optimal efficiency. And that's what we're trying to do. For this system of whiteness as normalcy, trying to break it down individually is an exercise in futility. James Baldwin gets in this when he talks about his feelings around white people. He says, I cannot assume to know what white people think about black people. I only can tell they think by the state of their institutions. So as long as the institutional level is, is, is not fixed the way it should be, then individual action becomes uh, an effort in you spinning your wheels. It's an, it's an exercise in futility. There has to be system level changes in order to achieve this more uh, holistic inclusion that we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Um, there's another question that I wanna pull in and I'm gonna preface this because I'm gonna call on you in, uh, in a few minutes, uh, our future student, Dr. Uh, Christian Watts. So what is the process for students 
when they feel like they are facing microaggressions from faculty and staff at the institution. Um, Dr. Lockett or Dr. Bodhi, can you all make a comments at, um, at the medical school? We recently have developed something called the equity response team and students can come to us uh, if they need to work on anything, if they feel like they're facing microaggressions from anybody so that we can try to address that. Because I think that one of the challenges that um, Christian Watts brought up is that there is a hierarchy that's in place. And when you have somebody who is grading you, how are you supposed to educate and illuminate with that person what's going on when that person has the power to do something with your grades? So Dr. Bodhi or Dr. Lockett, and then um, Christian, if you can chime in on ways that you feel that a student can be supported more when they're in these situations in real time. Yeah, I can speak on that very quickly. So um, a couple of years ago, we instituted something called the Bias Incident Response Team. And it's an, a way for people to be able to submit electronically some sort of um, um, an incident report that will give us a little bit of a rundown of what's occurred. And it's through that mechanism that we at least attempt to respond to um, the concerns. I will say that um, like if I reflect on my statements about my experience with some medical providers in the past, it took me a long time to realize that there was anything about that that could have to do with race. Um, and so I think that there's often sometimes, many times, where people either aren't at a place of recognition or aren't at a place of wanting to be bothered, which I think contributes to or can contribute to why um, if you pull data, uh, it isn't necessarily a reflection of all the, con the concerns that exist, uh, but is a mechanism that's currently uh, managed by student affairs. Okay. And I would add um, that our, our certain, our teaching evaluations um, and our teaching evaluations. So, I know after I would teach, uh, after a semester, we would have the traditional scantrons, but then the African Studies Department also had um, this um, more qualitative, more open-ended questions. It was, I believe it was five or six questions and that uh, students, they got on me, right? Uh, or they, but they got on me to, cause I was also a board member at that time. So my students who weren't comfortable uh, speaking at coming to a board meeting or didn't feel um, that like they were maybe not like welcome. Yeah, we'll say that welcome in certain rooms. Um, they would ask, uh, they were put on the evaluations because certain people, some people threw away evaluations um, and the ones who actually cared to be more reflexive as uh, professors, uh, we looked at them. And so I, and I'm like, I'm spending 16 weeks with these individuals and I didn't get any of this, right? Um, and so the evaluations, um, the more open-ended responses, as well as um, the, I guess my emails were just full of a lot of things. So it was just creating that space, but that's where some of the, uh, how people would, um, you know, speak on these incidents and, um, and also things like this. I know I would not have the campus conversations. Um, I would get either letters or I got a lot of anonymous letters. Um, and so I would get those letters and that's when, when people were feeling comfortable to speak on these things and to help, uh, well, at least help me and then share that with other faculty, staff, administrators and the board. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. Great. So Christian, as you're hearing some of these things, can you talk with us about what are some different supports that you think would help students or even residents in, in medicine be able to come forward more so that we're not perpetuating things going forward. King notes. Um, um, I would just say, you know, the same way administration has policies set in place to address academic dishonesty, I would say it's just as important to have policies in place regarding racism. Um, I think about the School of Pharmacy um, in particular, we actually have a diversity and inclusion committee which I served as the student representative for. And something that I do um, to kind of promote diversity within the School of Pharmacy is um, doing our student interviews for new um, applicants for the School of Pharmacy. I actually do a panel discussion where I talk about the importance of diversity. And so sometimes students of color, um, black or any other color um, are in that meeting and they actually hear that and it encourages them to um, 
pursue a major with us because we realize even though this is a predominantly white institution, there are supports and efforts being made to make me feel included. And so I would just say, you know, having diversity and inclusion committees, having policies in place, um, and then also allowing the conversation to be had. So you know, the things that we're doing now, doing that within your specific, um, what do you call it, uh, field or major, like we have the dental school, the nursing school, doing that within your specific um, umbrella is just as important as well. So those are some things that I feel like would help students feel more comfortable. Dr. Saraf, were you gonna say something? Yeah, well, Dr. Saraf and Dr. Lewis and Dr. Bodie, so y'all can go after that. You touched on something, Dr. Elamy. I would, um, I was thinking back to the, the pathway analogy that was given earlier about the brain. And, and one of the things that we do know about trauma and traumatic events is that um, it can be mitigated early on if we have the right types of supports in place, right? So if, if someone walks across the grass and we see that happen and we immediately put the supports there to mitigate that, to, to offset that trauma, we can prevent that from becoming a permanent path. And so having those types of trauma mitigation strategies loaded and ready to roll, um, which is, is part of what we're trying to create at the School of Medicine right now, right, is, is a place for, um, someone to step in and mitigate right away as soon as we know something has happened. So that that was one thing that I wanted to add to this. And, and the second thing in this, I'm going to just sort of toss out there and see what happens when I do so. But we talked about fight, flight, and freeze, but we missed a really, really important trauma reaction. And that is submit. And um, submission to dominant culture um, can be a trauma reaction. Um, submission to a situation can, can be a trauma reaction, either because our grade is on the line, our health is on the line. We've so normalized the white experience that we don't even recognize it as being abnormal. Um, but that submission reaction is a trauma, is a trauma reaction. And it sometimes is a very, very, very harmful one that gets overlooked. And so I just sort of wanted to, to toss that one out there because one of the places that I'm seeing it show up the most right now, and one of the things that's the most worrying, worrisome to me um, is in what I call the dark side of resilience. Um, we see, um, I mean, resilience is a critical skill. I don't, I don't wanna downplay the importance of it. Um, but if we view our sort of our resiliency reservoirs as something that has two things. Number one, what's flowing into it? And number two, how many spillways do we have open and, and, and how much water are we allowing to pour out? Um, I think that in the time of COVID, coupled with sort of the acute on chronic racial trauma that's being experienced, um, in particular, uh, our black students, our black colleagues are being asked to step up and open those spillways full blast at every single turn. And, um, and there is a upstream drain that is happening because the water is pouring out of that reservoir and where, how, how robust are those rivers that are coming in? And so two things I think about, number one, um, it's incumbent on all of us to sort of look at how many spillways we have open at any given time and recognize which ones are actually critical and which ones we need to turn off for self-preservation. And number two, if we are in leadership positions, standing downstream, looking at that dam and looking at how many spillways are open in, in our black colleagues who are in positions and in, in high power positions, how much are we asking of them? And is it time to stop? Because it looks like the reservoir is unending. I mean, it looks like that water is just pouring out and yet um, damage is being done, water levels are dropping. And it is, I think it is a very trauma informed thing uh, to be aware of and, um, and very, very mindful of that, that folks are, they're at surge capacity. They're at surge capacity and we need to stop asking so much. 
On that note, why don't we all take a deep breath? Okay. Um, I think Dr. Lewis wanted to make a, a comment on that one as well. I'm going to try to go slow here because unlike most of you, my area of expertise is not in trauma or in any real area of the medical field. I am a political scientist. Therefore, I approach things from a point of political activism. If you are a student and a faculty member, staff member has exhibited racism towards you, my advice to you is to follow Dr. King's theory of restorative justice. What Dr. King says is first document the incident, have sufficient evidence, and then submit an actual complaint following whatever procedures are in place. As you submit that complaint, be ready to be told no. Under Dr. King's theory, he knows that in white structures, nothing will happen in your favor. Accept the no, take your evidence and the no, and then give it to the media. Post it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, any social media outlet you can find. Contact CNN, the ACLU, the Southern Poverty Law Center, anybody you can. King says if you bring attention to the issue, then that's where you will find your coalition of allies to help you change the issue. Once there's attention and once you have allyship, he says that the structures in place will want to come back to the negotiating table to help you. It is at that point that you make your demands about what you want. It is my sincere belief that that works every time. No student should have to endure racism when they are paying for a degree that they will likely pay for for the next 10 to 20 years of their lives. Thank you. Dr. Bodhi, um, I wanna bring another question in and maybe you can infuse some of this in. And the question is, can somebody please address the fact that any white person um, is not interested in changing the system because they benefit from it and it was designed that way. So how do we incentivize this? So any thoughts on how do we incentivize changing the system? so that there's more accountability. Yeah, I think that, um, and these are active efforts that we have going on at the eCampus. Um, if p and doesn't have some teeth, if the Employee Excellence Program, which is the way in which administrative professional and civil service staff are evaluated, doesn't have some portion in there around cultural competency, and then when you turn it over and you see the pieces about the supervisor, there are ways in which the supervisor is being evaluated around those sorts of things. And the institution has clear metrics around this and it's part of sanctioned university policy. Then I think you suddenly have an incentive, um, not perhaps the one that's ubiquitous in terms of affecting or being particularly incentivizing for all folk. But I think again, um, drawing on this notion that most people are probably trying to do right and live in a society in which they fundamentally been taught either up or down um, for themselves and for other people, um, then I think that there is a considerable amount of headway that can be made there. But I also think that it's a way of encouraging and inviting people for whom those institutional values and those policies are incongruent to find other employment. Um, and that's all I got to say about that. Any, any other comments? I think he just dropped the mic on that one. All right. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to ask another question. Um, we have about 15 more minutes. So can we talk a little bit about what are some of the mitigation strategies? I mean, we have all lived through some form of race-based stress. What are some of the mitigation strategies that um, people are using to be able to create their own sustainability through this time? Well, if I could start, um, 
generally speaking, everyone's response to traumatic events is not the same. There are some pretty profound ways in which people inherit and learn um, and the ways in which those forces converge um, to be quite protective. To, you know, I always think about grit, for example, is like bubble wrap. You need to have some, it's gonna get popped and you need to have a mechanism that alerts you to getting some more and actually encourages you to do so. Um, and so in that theme of everyone's response not being the same and people having perhaps built in protective mechanisms, I'm always curious when I'm working with people, whether it's in a clinical context or outside of it, how have you been taking care of yourself? And not the, you ask people what their strengths are and they can't answer because they haven't necessarily thought about that sort of thing, but more like even in the super subtle ways, let's like go on the hunt for it. It's amazing, like trauma, we didn't used to look for it. We used to call it all of its symptoms, all of the things that come after it. The person is high on depression, the person is high on anxiety, the person is using all these substances. So then you look at their chart and they're and kind of messed up versus let's actually talk about the underlying concern. Um, in that same type of way, we can help people to find the ways in which they cope, even if it might look like all sorts of other things, because I'm always amazed by the ways in which people can reach into an existing toolkit and pull out resources and use them perhaps differently. And maybe that's the way in which external help can be valuable. What about some of our other panelists, Dr. Lockett? Oh, I think Jamie had her hand up first. Okay, That's okay. Go, ahead. Mark. go ahead. My mom told me women first, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was just gonna build on that a little bit. I think, you know, um, it's really a two prong approach. I think that we have to remember that with anti-racism, it's everybody, it's all of our job. And, you know, I think going back, this connects to the last question, you know, part of white privilege is not having to be faced with it and not recognizing, you know, where it is. But I think, you know, those micro affirmations that you're talking about are very important creating a culture where anti-racism is not tolerated and creating a, a, a culture of inclusion where the micro affirmations are very important, you know, a culture of allyship, being able to speak up, face those silence, be able to sit with the uncomfortable, be able to talk about the uncomfortable, have a lot of conversations like we're having tonight um, and be able to speak to your own experience, not assume that everyone's experience is the same. You know, we, we've talked a couple times today that there's a lot of different types of oppression. There's a lot of different people from lots of different different intersections of identities uh, that have been oppressed and to recognize that, you know, when you're oppressing one identity, you're also making it unsafe for somebody who might have a different underserved identity. And so it's really important to understand the impact of that. You know, then there's also the individual's responsibility. You might not have created the problem and there's still some responsibility in your life, you know, to feel better and to seek out support and help when you need that. And so, you know, I think part of that is re um, challenging some of the ideals of that internalized stuff. So once you have the coping skills, being able to say, you know what, um, I've internalized that as a problem with me when really this is a problem with X, you know, and being able to work through some of those treatment uh, strategies, being able to work on that identity, working on some interpersonal effectiveness skills to say, this is a relationship that's toxic for me. I'm going to let that one go. And I'm going to be around people that are supportive of me. And I'm going to create a social system where I get more of those micro affirmations. And, you know, really learning those skills, you know, interpersonal effectiveness skills to stand up for yourself, to set some boundaries, to, to call it out and break that silence yourself. You know, it has to be, there's a environments that that's not going to work. There's environments that that's not safe, but in those environments that it's safe, I think it's two pronged. It's all of us. We have to stop and, and create an environment that is conducive to this, and we have to heal old wounds. We have to go back and deal and heal some of that past trauma. And unfortunately, it's there. It's already happened. It's happened on a daily basis for many people for a long time. So I think we have to approach it from both of those prongs. Thank you. What about some of our students? What are some things that you all are doing? I love that Audrey Lord, she said that caring for myself is, is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare. Every time I read that, it gives me permission to go sit down and relax just a little bit before I get back up and go again. <laughs> okay, Christian. So we're still addressing the question about um, whites benefiting from something and not really wanting to change it? 
we can do that one. And then we can also go into what type of things are you doing for self-care so that you can continue being oh. resilient, both of them. Okay. So about the first one, I would just say, you know, really just asking yourself the question, am I really okay benefiting from something that's causing people to die? That's causing people to lose jobs. That's causing people to just be treated unfairly in general. And if the answer to that question is yes, I would just say more self-evaluation needs to be done. Um, as far as ways to cope, um, I think it's subjective in a way because it just really depends on the individual. But for me, I know just having a strong base family, you know, talking to my family consistently um, or my mentors, that's something that helps me. Um, I'm strong. I'm strongly faith based as well. So talking to God helps me as well. Um, but besides that, I would just say, you know, also just taking care of yourself physically as well, you know, eating right, um, you know, exercising, talk to a, a therapist if you need to, you know, mental health, you know, simple things like that. I love that you bring in talking to a therapist because I think that there's a, a huge stigma to talking to a, a therapist and we really need to get past that stigma and realize that people are just learning to change different, the way their thought patterns, that they're just seeking clarity, that they're breaking down complex issues and getting different insights. So thank you for bringing that in. Kyra, were you going to add? Yeah, I was. Um, I want to talk about like the latter half of the question, or, like how to take care of yourself um, and also add on to like the stigma of like um, black people and depression. Um, I was just watching this, um, this Criminal Minds episode and it was about, um, it was like a murder or whatever. And the cop asked him if he was depressed and if his son had any history of mental illness and the, it was a black man that was answering and he said, Black people don't have time to be depressed. And I just thought that was really profound because um, I think that as, um, especially in the black community, we are we have that mindset of, you don't have time to be depressed. You have to do this, that, and the other. And I think that um, it's really stigmatized. So um, me personally, I have like been seeing a therapist and talking to other people. And something that helps me cope is um, journaling and getting like at the end of the day, just getting it all off my mind and being able to sleep in peace where um, I can, I know that it's all in the journal and I know that I have done everything I can in that day to help that day and I can do more things tomorrow. Um, another thing that I personally do to help cope is um, being an effective change in the places that I am. And so I am a woman of color and I am, um, I am in a position on the volleyball team where I am a leader and I can do um, things that some other people may not be able to do. So I can use my voice in ways that um, help people instead of hurt people. And so I think that's um, one of the ways that I cope is just um, trying to help wherever I can and be a voice for the voiceless, so. Thank you. Dr. Lockett? I would, I think everyone had kind of like touched on it. Uh, my thing is some people solve things with an email, right? Uh, a memo and some people solve things by talking to grandma, physically talking to grandma. And so we're talking about uh, the notion of culturally competent, uh, cu cultural competency um, and doing so to, um, to cope with stressors. Like my research is with uh, the Native American population, more specifically uh, the Sioux. And I am now in Utah and I'm getting um, one of them within a multicultural and inclusion center. And so I'm every day I'm um, working with uh, either Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, um, you name it. And so I've been invited to a bunch of future powwows, right? So we, so whatever we do, and we talk, I've heard Faith Base was on here as well, right? Um, it has to be um, respective of the community individuals are coming from. There's no one size fits all. Um, and we talk about that qualitative aspect of it. Um, and that's, you know, a part of qualitative is, you know, I'm eth not ethnographic research, like that fully immersed into a culture. And so that's how I'm, that's what I've learned. And that's what I've seen is where to cope with these, we need the community, we need our families. Um, and I think that's what happens at what we think about now is off we've, it's been di a disconnect from our communities and our families. Thank you. 
Um, Dr. Lewis, uh, one, one person wanted to know if you had social media. So if you actually have social media, is that something you would like to share or would we like to? Uh, yes, I do have social media. If you want my political opinions, advice and commentary, then you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. T.E. Lewis at Dr. T. E. Lewis is my hashtag on Twitter. Thank you. And it, it just to be authentic, you know, it's hard when you're doing Zoom and people can't come with their microphone and, and, and speak. So I wanna put another one into uh, our arena. This one said, we don't have to reward people to keep them from being murderers, but we can have uh, to reward people to get them to be conscious of their privilege and for combating the oppressive system they created. So does anybody have a comment on how we have to reward people to become more conscious? That sounds like a Dr. Lewis one. Could you repeat the question for me, please? Right, so um, I, the, I think to, just to summarize it, why is it that we have to reward people for being conscious of their privilege and reward them for understanding the oppressive system that they created? I don't think we have to. Neither do I think that we should do that. Rewarding people for being decent human beings undermines the entire notion, entire notion of being a decent human being. Rewarding for someone for doing things they should do is, is a flawed logic to me. Um, but I think what the individual is getting at is that there's a system that tends to reward or compensate allies, particularly white allies, when they come to some realization about racism and racial trauma. Um, not knowing all the time that that only adds to the system, rewarding someone who's already privileged for something they shouldn't get a reward from to begin with. That only adds this notion, and it leads to something that is very dangerous, it's called performative allyship. It leads to this notion where people do these symbolic gestures that have no substantive meaning in changing the system, and then they get a reward for it. And I think that's a very dangerous and slippery slope. Thank you. Um, one of the things about the, these conversations of understanding that I have really enjoyed is that we're able to really break down silos and to bring different disciplines together. And I think that the more we can have these multidisciplinary conversations to come up with new solutions and to create new innovation, I think that that is going to be critical for us to get to um, the other side of this. So at this time, I am going to um, ask if there are any final comments before we have Dr. Mahoney to close for us. You all have really endured. I think that we've had, uh, this is our third conversation of understanding. The first one was on systemic racism in higher education. The second one was on hate speech. And this one was on uh, race-based trauma and mental health. And we really have been on a journey together. I think that we have created some true authentic dialogues to get to the next level. I think people have an opportunity to really get proximate and to understand what our students, our faculty and our staff are experiencing. And um, I appreciate you all creating a courageous space tonight. I, I think you, I know that I feel vulnerable being on Zoom and not knowing who's in the room, but trusting the process that our stories must be heard. People should not only celebrate the positive things, they should also be close to the pain. So on that, Dr. Mahoney, I'm gonna ask if you have any final words that you'd like to say. Yeah, so I have a few things. First, I again, wanna thank the panel. I think it was, was mentioned earlier, we're asking a lot of people right now uh, to open up and talk about things. I know that's never easy. so I. Always appreciate when people are willing to do that. Um, I always take things away from this and, and I think learn some things uh, about what people are thinking. And um, I've now learned Dr. Lewis's uh, Twitter account, so I'll be following him there. Uh, but I learned some other things too. And I, and I think one of the things um, that I was reflecting on, and I have a whole bunch of notes here, um, but this notion of, uh, and uh, Dr. Lewis said this really well, it's two things he said that I really stuck with me. One is this focus on equality. Um, I always focus on equity, not equality. And I think they're vastly different. And it's important as a system we're focusing on equity. That doesn't mean treating everybody equally, 
because not everybody's had the same experiences. Not everyone you know, equally doesn't really work. And we think sometimes it does. And that's hard for people to understand. Um, and also the notion of system level change and, and really ch dramatically changing the system. And I've been talking about things that we're doing to make changes. Um, but I think as Dr. Lewis talked about, we're trying to, I'm trying to dramatically change an entire system. Um, and that's not easy, nor is it quick to do. Um, that will take some time and, and to do it right will take a lot of effort from a lot of people. Um, even talking about the student evaluations, which is one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately, just changing that one aspect of the promotion process is not an easy thing to do, as you know how university governance works, but it's a critical thing to do. Um, and I think there's a number of things that we could do differently there. Um, and even thinking outside of what we do within the institution, you know, I think Christian's story kind of stuck with me and it was similar to an experience I had a previous institution that sometimes it's the experience of internship sites or outside the institution that can be damaging and how as an institution do we um, address some of those? And, and that's even more difficult sometimes addressing what's inside the system. Um, and I will say we tried to address it in my previous institution and it did not go well. Um, they were not very open to the, the suggestions we made about making change, but I'm so glad we did it. Um, you know, I also thought, reflected on the notion of the micro affirmations and thinking about things even I can do in my own classes uh, to make sure I teach class on the history and current issues of college athletics and I talk a lot about the black athlete experience, but I don't often get into a lot of the other races. And part of that is they're not as present in intercollegiate athletics, which in and of itself is a story. And when it, in and of itself is an important thing to reflect on and talk about in more detail why that's the case. And I do it some, but I, I think I could do a better job. Um, I think when Dr. Bodhi talked about being a cisgender white male um, and there's certain obligations that go with that to, to try to talk with others who are similar to me and trying to get them to make some changes. Um, I think, uh, you know, I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, I fully recognize the fact that I've benefited from the systems that exist. Fully recognize that. And I'd be foolish not to recognize that. Um, and sometimes people say, why should I feel guilty? I don't necessarily feel guilty. Some of those systems existed long before I was born. I didn't create them. I feel guilty if I don't do anything to change them. That's where the guilt comes in. If I do nothing and I accept that, that's where I should feel guilty. Um, and I have an obligation to change it. And going back to the notion of, of race-based trauma, I, I thought I wasn't gonna initially do this, but I think this is a story that hits on some of the things that you all talked about. So I'll share a story that I have. Obviously it's not race-based trauma related to me. I haven't had that kind of directed towards me, but it is a story that I was involved with that involved a friend of mine. Um, this was about 30 years ago. I was out with a few friends. Uh, it was late at night and we were looking for someplace to go just to have a drink and talk. And one of my friends is, is black and the other three of us were white. And we walked into this bar we normally didn't go into. And it wasn't like the music stopped and everybody stared at us, but it kind of felt like that the second we walked in. And we almost walked back out. But we thought, you know, this isn't Mississippi or Alabama, 1950, 1960s. This is New Jersey, 1989. We should be okay to walk into this bar. Um, mistake on our part. So we, we go into the bar, we go to a booth, we sit down at a table, and everybody's still staring at us. And this guy at the table next to us starts talking to my friend who was black, Stan. He says to Stan, you know, where are you from? And he says, well, I'm, I'm here. I grew up here. He says, well, I'm from Arkansas. And he says, what do you do? He says, well, I'm a student at Seton Hall. He says, what are you going to be when you grow up? He says, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. And the guy looked at him and said with a sneer, I want to be a brain surgeon. We had our last, our last lecture was on hate speech. And that was one of the most hateful things I heard because it was the way it was said. It was condescending. It was threatening to him. Um, I will say at that moment, Stan de-escalated the situation. And, but my reaction at that moment was, I was 25 years old at the time. I thought, I've had 25 good years. Um, if this is where it ends, this is where it ends. But I didn't think we were getting out of there. I thought we were done. Um, and I think if Stan had reacted differently, we would have been in a whole heap of trouble uh, because it was the whole bar against the four of us. Um, and even though one of my friends was an Army Ranger, I still don't think we were getting out of that. In fact, I will say the Army Ranger was probably as traumatized as I was at the moment. And this is somebody who was trained to go into difficult situations. And he felt more threatened in that bar than he did going to war. Um, and that should say something about what that atmosphere was like. I've reflected on that a lot since the time it happened. And a couple of things kind of stuck with me. One is that my friend Stan could handle that so easily. And what that told me was that wasn't his first time, that he had dealt with that so many times that he could deal with it 
in a way, the other three of us were just frozen solid. We had no idea what to say at that moment. The second was the responsibility we place on people of color and black people to deescalate situations. And we hear this over and over again, whether it's a situation with police or it's a situation with this, why didn't they do something to deescalate the situation? All of the responsibility was on him to deescalate the situation. In fact, even after it happened, I remember him talking with us, he was calming us down. There's something really wrong with that that stuck, has again stuck with me. The other thing was that for me, this was a singular event. The second I walked out that door, I was safe and I never had to deal with it again. And for him, this was something that he would have to deal with again and again and probably has throughout the rest of his life. So go back to Dr. Lewis's uh, opening to this, which I thought was really fantastic was if you ask Stan to give an example of a race-based trauma, he may not even remember that one because it was just one of probably many he has dealt with in his life. So what can I do or what should we be doing? One is understanding how these events may impact people, whether they're campus events, national events, that the reactions may be different because they've had a series of experiences long before that particular event. It's not a singular event. It's part of a long-term thing that they've experienced. And we should be able to empathize with that. We should also look for ways to not only support, but change the systems that we're part of. And that's really what our goal is at SIU. We know we're not there yet. Dr. Lewis is right. We're not there yet. We have a lot of changes left to make, but that is what we're committed to doing is doing things differently in the future, upending the system, making the system different and focusing very much on equity. So again, I wanna thank all of our panelists for being part of this um, and thank everybody who joined us uh, through YouTube. Have a good evening. All right, bye-bye. Thank you all. <laughs>